Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for uh, attending this talk. Um, I would say that putting together uh, the talk with, uh, with the African Studies program has been a labor of love, uh, quite literally. This is a speaker who I've had the pleasure of getting to know for um, many a year. Um, and I would probably be dating myself if I told you how many years, but more than a decade, I'll put it that way. Um, I also think that the timing is great with um, uh, Aliyah mentioning the AC Jordan uh, prize among other uh, African studies related uh, announcements that she was making there because uh, of course, AC Jordan being a South African scholar and being one of the sort of uh, columns on which my whole department is built and in a lot of ways, African studies uh, is built here uh, at UW Madison. So, you know, that's that's a, a great opportunity that I, you know, get an extra reminder of uh, of uh, that students have in front of them now that we're talking explicitly uh, about South Africa, as Zachary Levinson is going to do. Um, Zachary Levinson is an assistant professor of sociology at University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, he studies uh, the po uh, politics and, um, and populations uh, of South Africa. He's interested in the idea of surplus, especially surplus as it pertains to uh, late capitalist societies, um, uh, versions of state uh, observation of population and of course housing. And um, he sort of treated uh, my uh, African, uh, 201 class yesterday uh, to a wide ranging uh, conversation about his experiences, both uh, formal research oriented experiences in South Africa and personal experiences uh, in South African uh, society. And I really, I, I, and I'm saying this not, not just to offer uh, empty praise, I think it really sort of captivated the audience. Um, and uh, I think, you know, provided a, a, a new dimension to the literary study that we do uh, in a class like that. There is one more anecdote that I'd like to tell you about. And uh, Zach, I uh, apologize if this is getting a little too personal, but, you know, there's this um, idea of, uh, you know, grad students like hustling to get the, the rent paid and such, but they have like a huge record collection. Um, that was kind of how I thought of Zach when we were in grad school uh, together. He is one of the most knowledgeable people uh, about music uh, who I have ever met. And uh, this is like totally separate from the fact that he was doing all this fantastic stuff in grad school on social theory as well. And I remember one time tuning into a radio program and just hearing him like drop jewels about uh, Weberian uh, understandings of, of, uh, of the state and the relationship uh, to the citizen. Um, aside from that, like popular music, if you want to talk about popular music, this is the person to do it with. With that said, um, Zachary Levinson, thank you for joining us. I'm uh, very much uh, looking forward uh, to this talk uh, about um, seeing a population and I'll hand it over to you. Can you hear me okay? Great. So I'm really happy to be here today, um, albeit virtually, and thanks Sam for that warm introduction. I wish my students uh, thought I was as knowledgeable about popular music as, as you did, and they didn't laugh at my bad jokes. Um, and thanks also to, to UW's African Studies program for hosting. I had no idea that Africa at noon went back to the early 70s, um, so it's really, really a treat to, to be here today. Today, I'm going to talk to you about evictions in contemporary South Africa, and I'm going to focus in particular on a case study of Cape Town. Now, Cape Town today remains the most active site of new land occupations in the country. And so I want to open my talk uh, by telling you a bit about two land occupations that I observed um, while I was in Cape Town in the period 2011 to about 2014. But before I do that, I want to just briefly um, say something about what I mean when I use this term land occupation, just so we're all on the same page. So a land occupation is the process whereby residents in need of housing claim a parcel of land to which they don't have legal title. You know, sometimes these, these occupations might be small with just a few participants. But more often, they involve dozens, if not hundreds, 
or even thousands, as you'll see today, of actors. And they quickly erect shacks from whatever building materials they may have, and then they live on the land. So this is what happened, for example, on a field called Captain's Cliff. So this, this field is located in Cape Town's second largest township called Mitchell's Plain. And it's the first of the two occupations I want to tell you about. Both took place in the same township, Mitchell's Plain. And I'll say something about Mitchell's Plain in a moment. So in 2011, thousands of homeless South Africans converged on this field, Captain's Cliff, which was public land, i.e. owned by the municipality of Cape Town. And it was adjacent to the final stop on a commuter railway. So if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but um, you can see this is, is the train track. This is where it ends. This is the field where people set up shop. And this is a cul-de-sac. So this is a, a road that while it goes to pick up people from this final stop on the commuter railway um, is quite out of the way. None of the shacks that were built in this land occupation interfered with the train's functioning. And I should mention that this was the poorest part of Mitchell's Plain and that the land was not particularly valuable. More importantly, there were no middle-class homeowners who were worried that some growing informal settlement might affect their property value. So if you look in the top right, you can see a couple houses. Um, these are very solidly working class homes. They're rent to own homes. Um, and this is among the most working class and poor areas of the entire township. So every participant in the Captain's Clip occupation identified as colored in apartheid era racial category distinct from African. And the surrounding neighborhood was itself nearly entirely colored. Colored people in Mitchell's Plain overwhelmingly vote for the city's governing party the Democratic Alliance or the DA. And so there's no reason for DA affiliated officials to suspect that the occupation was some kind of ploy to bring rival voters into DA territory. So I'll come back to Captain's clip, but I just wanted to introduce it here. The second occupation I want to tell you about took place on a plot called Sicalo, also located in Mitchell's Plain, just a few kilometers down the road from Captain's clip. A few hundred occupiers set up shop in Sikala, which in contrast to Captain's Cliff was on private property. While it started out much smaller than Captain's Cliff, it quickly grew until there were 2,600 shacks on the field within a few months. And unlike the colored occupiers in Cape Town, the majority of the Sikala occupiers were so-called African and their first language was Isitosa. Most of them moved from adjacent majority African townships into so-called colored territory. In both of these nearby, nearby townships, residents overwhelmingly vote for the DA's chief rival, the African National Congress or the ANC. And so it would not have been a stretch to read this occupation as an attempt to dilute DA support in Mitchell's Plain. So the Stalo occupation was also really visible if Captain's Cliff was located on that far-flung cul-de-sac I showed you a minute ago, in the poorest part of the township, Sikalo was built along a main road, and you can see it right here, that connects Mitchell's Plain to Cape Town's Central Business District. Now, just across the road, and it's unfortunately cut off here, you can see some of these houses. And this was one of um, Mitchell's Plain's wealthier neighborhoods. You know, it would be a stretch to call it wealthy by, say, American standards. Um, but from the perspective of those in Mitchell's Plain, it was often identified as an upper middle class neighborhood called Colorado. So the neighbors in these houses wanted the occupiers gone. They actually mobilized. So here, here are a couple photos of them in the street demanding, you can see, move Sikalo or hoot if you want them relocated. In Captain's Clip, no neighbors had challenged the occupation. But across from Sitalo, the homeowners mobilized for months, demonstrating in the streets, demanding that the city have the occupiers evicted. The contrast couldn't really be starker. So colored occupiers were in colored territory in Captain's Clip, 
They were likely supporters of the governing party. And land wasn't even private property. No neighbors demanded the removal. But in Sigalo, African residents were in colored space and they were seen as supporters of a rival party. Their occupation was extremely visible from the main road, unlike Captain's Cliff, and middle-class neighbors demanded their immediate eviction. What a surprise then, when it was Captain's Cliff's shacks that were cleared, with every one of its residents evicted and left to fend for themselves. But in Sipralo, a judge ruled that residents could not be legally evicted and they were granted the right to stay put. We would of course expect the opposite outcome. So how to make sense of this situation? And I should say, make sense of this paradox. So in today's talk, I wanna suggest that this outcome appears as less of a paradox when we examine it from a perspective that tends to be overlooked in the literature, the self-organization of occupiers. To preview my argument, if James Scott famously wrote about how states see populations, I wanna suggest that this formulation naturalizes populations as a part of a, a social landscape. It assumes, in other words, that populations are distributed across a given territory and that coherent states simply act upon them. But states don't simply see ready-made populations. These populations, I wanna to argue today, first, have to emerge through processes of collective deliberation. We can't think of the state as active and civil society as passive, in other words, with the state gazing out over a landscape of pre-existing populations. Instead, residents need to become a population, hence the title of my talk. They're not inherently part of a population that already exists. Only then, I'll argue, do they become legible to government actors. So if we turn back to the Sicalo and Captain's Cliff occupations, notice how all the variables I discussed, race, party affiliation, visibility, presence of host hostile neighbors, and so forth. These all assume that the organizational form of the land occupation is similar across cases. But as I'll show you in a moment, this couldn't be further from the truth. So I wanna borrow two terms here from Jean-Paul Sartre to illustrate this contrast. And then I'll show you how and why different occupations assume different forms. So Sartre used this term series to describe a collection of people all acting in relation to a common object. In this case, the object was the land. So Captain's Cliff was then a serial occupation. And so when I say serial, I'm referring to series here. Residents in Captain's Cliff erected shacks on the same field at the same time, but they understood themselves to be mutually exclusive proprietors, homeowners in the making. They're relatively atomized, we could say. Sigalo, by contrast, approximated what Sartre called a fused group, a collective project that requires a common sense of purpose. In Sigalo, residents organized collectively and elected a leadership that functioned as a sort of informal government. They were a fused group acting consciously and collectively rather than just simultaneously. Now, I do wanna be clear here. I'm not suggesting some kind of necessary correspondence between organizational form and eviction outcome. There are many cases of occupiers comporting themselves as a fused group, but facing eviction nonetheless just as there are cases of serial occupations that manage to fend off forced removal. But it does suggest that we need to pay attention to the collective politics of squatters. Residents must become populations, and in this sense, populations are outcomes to be explained rather than to be taken as a given. So under what circumstances do occupiers become population? What I wanna argue in what follows is that how occupiers see the state affects how they are seen by the state. How they imagine the state and what it wants from them impacts their organizational form. In Captain's clip, residents viewed the state as a potential partner in delivery. They were under the impression 
that each individual household would receive a plot sanctioned by the government. As a result, they were hailed as members of a series. But in Sicalo, residents understood the state to be an obstacle to their occupation. They were hailed as members of a fused group. I'm now gonna tell the story of both occupations, but in a relatively schematic fashion. So in the following two sections of this talk, I'll account for the emergence of both occupations, and I'm gonna explain how their participants saw the state and how they saw the state impacted how they represented themselves politically. And I'll trace these processes. Then in two subsequent sections, I'll explain how their political representation affected how they were seen by the state. But first, how residents saw the state in Captain's clip. So when the occupation in Captain's clip began, participants did not view it as an illegal act. Instead, they understood it to be the legal distribution of plots of land by an organization ambiguously related to the state. So there's this group called the Mitchell's Plain Housing Association that began holding meetings in the area, explicitly appealing to backyarders. Most people who lived in informal housing in Mitchell's Plain occupied backyard shacks. So sometimes backyarders, and a backyard shack looks like this. You can see a shack built quite literally behind a formal house. Now, most people who live in informal housing in Mitchell's Plain, by contrast with surrounding townships, occupy backyard shacks. It's the, in other words, the predominant mode of informal uh, living. Sometimes backyarders would find friends or family members who would allow them to set up a shack in the backyard, um, or else they would pay a monthly rate to a de facto landlord and sometimes in addition to land, they might get, here you can see an electricity hookup, um, they might get access to water. It all depends on, on what's negotiated. So this is why the MPHA, the Mitchell's Plain Housing Association meetings in their neighborhood immediately appealed to participants. In the months leading up to the occupation, they held gatherings at a local community center and a nearby elementary school. And as word spread, there were soon hundreds of people at these meetings. They're always chaired by MPHA members, though they sometimes brought guests with them. Um, and quite often they brought elected officials, usually ANC ward counselors with them. Most backyarders who attended these meetings were under the impression that the MPHA was related to Cape Town's Department of Human Settlement, the arm of the municipal government responsible for housing delivery. What they didn't know was that the MPHA was actually a front group for the African National Congress, the ruling party nationally, but the official opposition in Cape Town since 2006. Mitchell's Plain residents voted overwhelmingly for their chief rivals, the DA, with ANC supporters few and far between. Under 20% voted for, for parties other than the DA in Mitchell's Plain, I should mention. So in general, voting is strongly correlated with race in South Africa, and especially in Cape Town, with Cape Town's colored population tending overwhelmingly to support the DA and its, Af uh, its African population going for the ANC for the most part, though as I'll talk about in a little bit, for some other parties as well. So due to the spatial legacy of apartheid, these voting blocks are often adjacent, but mutually exclusive. So what was an ANC front group doing organizing a land occupation in non-ANC territory? Well, in the run-up to local elections, party operatives often organized land occupations in rival territory to expand their voter base. But MPHA members could not simply order a group of residents, even those in desperate need of land, to just walk onto a field and build. They'd lack the trust of participants. And besides, you know, given the, pre the precarity of land occupations, people would want some kind of guarantee that they're not gonna be evicted on the spot. So the MPHA, would need to figure out how to stave off the city's anti-land invasion unit. And you can see an ALIU truck in the background here. And the ALIU is an arm of the Department of Human Settlements tasked with monitoring new occupation. While ALIU employees are not legally allowed to use force or even remove people's belongings, they work in conjunction with the police who can't. 
The ALIU acts as quickly as its capacity allows, since South African law prohibits evictions once people's homes are established, even in cases of illegal, uh, of illegal occupation. So for this reason, if ALIU and the police can act before residents finish erecting and furnishing their structures, they can prevent an occupation. But if they don't catch them in time, they need to secure a court order before they can evict them. And this is written into uh, section 26 of the South African Constitution's Bill of Rights. So the MPHA held these meetings in Southeastern Mitchell's plan for months and there were hundreds of people at each assembly. Backyarders shared their stories of hardship from the floor and the MPHA succeeded in building a certain amount of rapport among these potential occupiers. But with one major caveat, the organization did not try to transform this empathy into solidarity and facilitate the birth of any kind of collective organization, let alone a social movement. Rather than building a cohesive force that could unite in the face of anticipated state repression, the MPHA represented the occupation as the distribution of plots of land to residents as if they're homeowners in the making. And frequent appearances by minor ANC politicians gave the meetings an air of legitimacy. So this was on full display when one of the occupiers named Faiza shared with me a copy of a journal she kept throughout the occupation, which she painstakingly put together with the historian Coney Benson at the University of the Western Cape. On its first day, she described the occupation's origins, and here's what she had to, to write. People moved on to the Captain's Clip Field on the 13th of May, 2011. I was on my way to the hospital and came across a meeting of the MPHA. They told us about this land invasion that was gonna take place. They didn't use those words, land invasion. They told us we were gonna get plots. They gave out numbers, little numbers, with their stamp on it and charged people 10 rand so less than well under a dollar for registering with them and gave us a plot. They had a book where they put your name and ID number, which they said would then secure your plot. And they said we'd get plots that Friday. So the formal order imposed by the MPHA, as well as the involvement of local politicians, made the process appear less as a land occupation and more as yet another means of legally obtaining access to housing. They'd register with an administrative body, in this case, the MPHJ, and then they'd subsequently receive the equivalent of title deeds, the moral authority to lay claim to a given parcel of land. So in a real sense, whether this was a self-appointed committee with ambiguous ties to the ANC or an actual representative of the Department of Human Settlements, residents initially perceived their participation as a legitimate engagement with an arm of the welfare state. The Captain's Clip occupiers saw the state as a partner in the occupation and they comported themselves accordingly as a group of property holders in the making. As atomized individuals acting out of self-interest, they formed small mutually exclusive factions with the aim of protecting their claims to the land against rival occupiers. The irony was, was that it was precisely this factionalism that rendered them less likely to be seen as a population in need of housing. Instead, that appear as disorderly opportunists whose immediate demands for inclusion undermine the formal rationality of the government's housing delivery program. It was in this sense that a judge would dismiss them as queue jumpers. And I will get to that in a minute. But first, I wanna talk about seeing the state in Sikalo. Now, Sikalo was a, a different story entirely. From the outset, this occupation was articulated as a collective project rather than the centralized distribution of plots to these prospective homeowners. This occupation was not organized by an outside group, let alone by political operatives who didn't even live there. Instead, it was a self-organized by a group of informal settlement residents who could no longer stay in their formal homes. In February, 2012, a few hundred of them left their homes to seek vacant land. So this was the first wave and they came almost exclusively from an informal settlement in the township immediately west of Mitchell's Plain, as you can see here, it's called Philippi. Residents erected shacks on an open field along a major thoroughfare, the one you saw on the map before, 
connecting Mitchell's Plain to the city center. And from their perspective, this land was clearly not in use. Unbeknownst to them, the field was actually private property. They didn't worry about the fact that there was a fairly large, well-organized middle-class neighborhood on the other side of the road. This neighborhood was effectively entirely colored, whereas the informal settlement west of Mitchell's Plain from which they came was primarily Isitlosa speaking African. So in this first wave, the occupiers cultivated a collective spirit that was not quite that of a social movement. None of the occupiers framed their actions in terms of post-apartheid land restitution, let alone decommodification, nor did they talk about making any kind of collective demands on the municipal government. They simply wanted to be left alone. Rather than making demands on the state, they hoped to evade its gaze altogether. And this largely had to do with how they saw the state. Most of the participants in this first wave came from the same perpetually expanding informal settlement in the next township over. The majority of its residents were officially tolerated, but as new shacks emerged in its inner cities, the anti land invasion unit would try to have them removed. And so this perpetual tussle with an arm of the municipal state was an entirely different experience from the backyarders who had occupied Captain's Cliff. Backyard shacks are rarely policed by the ALIU. And as an external organization, the MPHA framed their occupation as actually involving the state. But in the case of Scalo, residents shared a collective memory of the local government as their, as their ceaseless antagonist. So for this reason, they represented themselves very differently than did the Captain's Cup occupiers. In the case of Scalo, they sought safety in numbers, even appointing an unofficial representative of the occupation. This was Bong Nkosi, who was with the occupiers from the very beginning. Resident selection of this particular individual as a representative can partly be attributed to Bong Nkosi's charisma. He always seemed to have a plan or at least he spoke as, as if things were always going according to plan. And he's particularly skilled as an organizer. So as in most sizable land occupations, there were other people vying for leadership, including as in Captain's clip, front groups for political parties, or even people who explicitly represented major parties. So these included a left-wing ANC front group called the Sescona People's Rights Movement, as well as the economic freedom fighters which is currently South Africa's third largest party uh, in terms of parliamentary presence. In all cases, residents viewed these parties, whether front groups or otherwise, as divisive and voted to expel them from the occupation. So when the occupation was not met with resistance immediately, others began to move in. The ALIU can only intervene on private property when the landowners file for an eviction injunction. They have to secure a court order but it took them many months to do so. Once a few hundred shacks had gone up, others from the informal settlement in the next township over joined them, as did a number of backyarders from that township. Then squatters facing eviction in another nearby township began to join the occupation. This brought in a number of Afrikaans speakers who quickly established a colored corner of the occupation. By the end of the year, there were at least 6,000 inhabitants living in Skalo. This corner grew once Bong Kosi led a march some five miles to the Captain's Clip field as it was facing eviction. And this was immediately after the final ruling when the residents had a month to find alternative accommodation. Some two dozen Stalo occupiers urged the Captain's Clip residents to move with them back to Stalo, explaining that there is safety in numbers and that there are already hundreds of shacks up. And besides, unlike in Captain's Clip, the ALIU and police had not been a daily thorn in their side. Certainly police, uh, police had harassed residents, but they could not legally remove them from the field. So a few dozen evicted residents followed this contingent from Captain Clip back to Stalo. And when they arrived, they received a warm welcome. They're shown into a larger shack that functioned as a creche and they were told to rest. Residents brought them food and began to move them into shacks while they built their own. Most of them identified as colored, so moved into that section of the occupation, though it depended where there was space. 
Many of them also lived among Amakloso residents. While they're initially apprehensive due to both linguistic and cultural barriers, the hospitality they received more than made up for it. So now I want to turn back to Captain's clip and talk about being seen by the state in Captain's clip. So when the Captain's clip occupation commenced in May 2011, there were about a thousand people who set up camp on the field that day across the road from the Captain's clip train station. They'd each paid a small fee to the MPHA who instructed them to arrive early in the morning to secure their plots. And with members of the organization supervising, residents got on their hands and knees and quite literally began to define the boundaries of each of their yards, we could say, with wooden stakes and bits of string, really mimicking the logic, the logic of the enclosure of private property. So even if the homes they built were flimsy and the plots were small, residents largely perceived themselves as homeowners in the making acquiring a sense of autonomy absent to backyarders. In this preliminary phase, they therefore viewed the state as a partner in the occupation. They hadn't planned for a confrontation with law enforcement, nor had they talked about defensive strategies more generally. But six days later, the ALIU and the police arrived, as you can see in this photo, and they announced that they were there illegally. An officer produced an interdict and gave them five minutes to vacate the land. The occupiers moved to another field just a few hundred feet away and waited for their day in court, to which they were entitled by the South African Constitution. Residents therefore needed to think about how they would be seen by the state. One of them, a longtime activist, secured representation from the Legal Resources Center, the LRC, a high profile public interest law firm in Cape Town. The lawyer told them that they would have their day in court a few weeks later. In the meantime, residents continued to look to outside organizations for advice and material support. One such outside actor was Marina, a white Norwegian born director of a charity that claimed to help quote, poor coloreds on its website. She was also affiliated to an anti-African political party called the Cape Party, of which her son was a leader and perennial candidate. And the politics of that thing are a whole other lecture, um, but it, it's a, a small secessionist party. And while it might seem odd that a white supremacist would be aligned with colored squatters, she convinced them of the necessity of forming a white colored alliance against the very few Africans whom she defined as migrants who had joined the Captain's Clip occupation. By contrast, she identified the colored population as indigenous to the Cape, as opposed to migrant. So by late June, Marina succeeded in forming an alliance with the MPHA, and they worked to force the tiny minority of African squatters from the field. An occupation-wide meeting on the last day of the month, residents were skeptical of the MPHA's maneuvering, called attention to the danger of continuing to split the occupation and contending factions of small proprietors. And a few days later, they formed the rival alliance called Residents Unite. And they sought to break with this exclusivist politics pushed by the MPHA and Marina. So the day after the first official meeting, the land occupation physically sp uh, split into two opposing camps. And members of each faction threatened opposing groups with violence and sometimes actually fights burned out um, including burning rags thrown into each other's shacks at night. And so the court date was postponed repeatedly. In the meantime, the city government spokesperson told the community newspaper, quote, we are sympathetic that some people have been waiting for a long time for housing and may be impatient, but the city cannot allow people to illegally occupy vacant land or build informal structures. Legally invading land may delay or prevent formal housing in areas of invaded land. The Captain's Clip site has been identified for future housing projects, end quote. Well, today, more than eight and going on nine years after this statement, no housing developments are currently planned for the Captain's Clip field. But the city statement does get at one important truth. The municipal government, through self-provisioning, as a threat to the order required to operate a functioning housing delivery program. 
from the city's point of view, ordered homelessness is preferable to, to disorderly survivalism. Legal decisions and government statements obey a logic that opposes order to opportunism, mapping the former onto unitar unitary organization and the latter opportunism onto factionalism. So the high court finally issued a ruling on August 30th, 2011, but the occupation was not organized in a form legible to the municipal government. Instead, residents search for recognition from the local state was impacted by their seriality, which was in turn shaped by how occupiers saw the state. Since they initially viewed it as a partner in a redistributive project, they largely comported themselves as petty proprietors forming small alliances and competing with other occupiers. Whenever outside entities entered the scene, including the MPHA and Marina's charity, factions jockeyed with each other to align themselves with these organizations, hoping to secure a leg up over other residents. And the same might be said for residents' orientation toward their legal team. Rather than collectively interfacing with their lawyers through established representatives, members of each faction would scramble for the lawyer's attention. Exasperated, each lawyer would demand a single person with whom to exchange information, leaving it up to the residents to resolve this, this kind of struggle over representation, we might say. So when the judge issued his final ruling, he upheld the eviction order. He began by reproaching the occupiers as opportunists in Afrikaans, lecturing them about how the South African government was trying to secure their futures and that their disorderly composition made this impossible. He went on to condemn the MPHA, quote, for their own selfish purposes, they abuse the homeless and the poor. This is criminal on the face of it, he declared. Such elements don't belong in an ordered society who then abuse their own people who are vulnerable to their schemes. He dismissed the MPHA as a group engaging in, quote, haphazard business, as opposed to an orga a, quote, organization that fights for the rights of backyard dwellers. It was, as if, it was as if he were directly criticizing them for failing to, few, to form a fused group. The squatter's penchant for individualized rather than collective demands particularly irked the judge. That land, he said, seems to me to be really nice in a sarcastic tone with the sea air blowing over the hill. I wanna stay there. So now I'm gonna take me a piece of land so I can just sit there. Then it takes the city council months to get to me. And since I built my place and brought my children, even if I'm brought to court, it's now too late to evict me. It doesn't work like that. So he concluded his ruling by insisting that the remedy should be not to reward those who had jumped to the front of the, the housing waiting list, but rather to help them insert themselves onto this waiting list in an orderly fashion. The lawyers suggested, uh, he suggested, should provide guidance in getting them back onto the, the waiting list to ensure that, quote, things run smoothly and you don't have this situation. This was his approach to the victim. The perpetrators, he said, would face possible charges, those members of the MPHA. The deceivers must be denounced, he concluded his ruling. He then read an eviction order, giving the occupiers a month to get off the field. So for the first few months of the Sigalo occupation, to which I want to return now, being seen by the state in Sigalo, Representative power was concentrated in the hands of Bong Kosi alone. He was in direct communication with the occupier's pro bono lawyer, who they had also secured through the LRC, just as in Captain's clip. And he seemed to have amicable relations with representatives of the Department of Human Settlements whenever they'd stop by the field. Over time, though, residents grew skeptical of what they saw as his authoritarian tendencies. So at the height of Bong Kosi's rule, residents would line up outside a shack waiting to talk to him, and then the queue would stretch around the corner. It began as a way for residents to access their lawyer, or at the very least figure out what was going on with their case, but it quickly became a venue for mediation in, in interpersonal disputes, and really more broadly, informal governance of the entire settlement. Over time though, Bong Kosi grew less active in settlement level politics. He accepted a gig from the city, coordinating a toilet cleaning operation in the African township immediately east of Mitchell's Plain. The idea was that he had secured jobs for Scalo residents in return for political support. 
residents demanded an alternative, but they also feared splitting the population into rival factions. Their solution was to elect a 12 person committee that included both Bongkosi and their chief rival, a middle aged man who went by Ntando. It was evenly split between men and women, though when I attended the meetings, the men would invariably dominate discussion and the women rarely spoke. But the inclusion of both Bongkosi and Ntando, as well as other more neutral members, eased the tension, er, sorry, eased the transition to a more representative body. Residents' demands for this newly democratized committee appeared to have less to do with abstract principles of democracy than with the practical necessity of accessing information about their case. So just as in Captain's clip, court dates proliferated, and given that Bonkosi stopped reporting back to residents with any frequency, no one seemed to have any idea what was going on. The residents managed to secure a legal team through the same public interest firm used by the Captain's clip occupiers. And key to their victory was their combined ability to represent themselves as a population, a people legitimately associated with a given territory, rather than as opportunists, queue jumpers, or other kind of self-interested individuals whose presence in Sistalo was represented as fleeting and nomadic. Throughout their legal hearing, the city represented the squatters as opportunists, to use their advocates' word. And this fit with the city's larger attempt to represent all land occupiers as free riders in search of a quick buck rather than as homeless people in need. It is submitted that the legal position is that the opportunists should not be enabled to gain preference over those who have been waiting for housing patiently according to legally prescribed procedures. But where were they to go? Even the city's advocates acknowledged that the lack of options for many of the fellow squatters, but these same residents were denigrated as opportunists. This is despite the fact that, quote, the residents assert in terms that they do not wish to bump anyone off the housing list and that they, quote, do not assert a claim for formal permanent housing. So what was the nature of their opportunism? Well, ultimately it boiled down less to a specific instance and more to the way that the government imagines the, the logic of land occupation. So the city's advocates continued, Land invasion is inimical to the systematic provision of adequate housing on a planned basis. Occupiers are invariably opportunists who should not be enabled to gain preference over those who have been waiting for housing patiently according to legally prescribed procedures. So this unmanageable opportunism was counterposed to orderly subjects of redistributive democracy, those who have been waiting for housing patiently. The advocates continued, for this reason, the residents should not be permitted to claim permanent housing ahead of anyone else in a queue. The residents' legal team challenged the city's argument as inconsistent. First, the very notion that the squatters are opportunists was belied by the fact that the city admitted that they were largely homeless. Whereas in Captain's Cliff, the city was able to successfully represent the squatters as opportunists vying with one another for plots of land. In the case of Stalo, it failed to do so. The city argued that the spontaneity of land occupations threatened the functioning of the delivery apparatus. The squatters' lawyers responded by questioning the inflexibility of the city's plan. Quote, the failure of a municipality to plan for or foresee the possibility of the eviction of a large number of poor people is no excuse for refusing to formulate a rational plan to provide alternative accommodation once the possibility of an eviction and consequent homelessness is drawn to its attention. So it's undoubtedly frustrating to those overseeing housing delivery when unanticipated externalities threaten the system's very function. Yet formal rationality is never an end in itself. The entire reason the city even has a housing policy is to accommodate those in need. So on June 3rd, 2013, the judge ruled in favor of the occupiers, but with some qualification. The city of Cape Town and two landowners agree, he wrote, that the consequences of an eviction at this stage will render the majority of the occupants homeless. He discussed them as a population, never as individual opportunists. Judging from the expert reports filed, he said, they have settled to the extent that there are now some 1800 structures, including creches and spaza shops on the land. And he never once referred to contending factions or internal strife, as was the case in Captain's clip, always discussing them in block. For now, the squatters were safe. So this then is how Captain's clip was designated for eviction 
where Sitalo was tolerated, ultimately growing to roughly 18,000 residents and 6,000 share. Now, more than eight years since Captain's Cliff was cleared in 2012, the municipal government still has no, no plans to develop the land. So it clearly was not a straightforward case of gentrification or a land grab. An alternative explanation would be to assume that the government had hostility to African squatters moving into predominantly colored space, especially given the sustained campaign by these colored middle-class homeowners to have them removed, but it was the colored occupation that was evicted. The same is true for partisan affiliation. The DA government would presume that colored occupiers would be more likely to support their party, whereas African occupiers would be more likely to support the rivals, the ANC and the EFF. But again, it was the former occupation that was clear. But if we shift our focus to intra-occupation dynamics, rather than taking these populations as facts on the ground, we come to understand how residents become population. Not all residents are represented in population. The populationness of any given settlement is itself variable. An occupation's organizational form then helps us explain an otherwise paradoxical outcome. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, Zachary Levinson, I, I don't want to take too much time before we just go right to uh, questions that you all might have in the audience. And as Diana has put up in the chat, you can hit the raise hand button or you can place a question in the Q&A box. Uh, looks like Gage Seidman. Yes. Thanks, Zach. That was really interesting. Um, I, I have a question, though. I'm a little bit, um, maybe, maybe I didn't follow exactly what you meant at the, in your conclusion um, when you said it has to do with the internal dynamics of the organization. Are you saying that the, um, so I'm not that familiar with Mitchell's Plains internal dynamics, but um, were they suspicious because the, um, Municipal authority, well, I can't remember what the housing organization was called in Captain's Clip, but um, it was an ANC, it was a, fr a front organization for the ANC, right? It was, though, the, um, I should mention that the, um, oh, shoot, sorry, that, that uh, go government officials didn't know this at the time, and they weren't trumpeting this. Oh, so it wasn't just that the judge or the DA was responding to it being an ANC front group. But no, actually, he had no idea it was an ANC front group, which I found really interesting. Um, it was only in private after they all went into ANC related organizations, including Sanco in the um, in that section of the township, that that it became clear that they're an ANC front. But uh, only some of the residents suspected it at the time because they would only bring in ANC ward counselors as speakers but they never um that would be a giveaway i'm sorry that would be a giveaway yeah no it, it was a giveaway to be clear but they never announced themselves as such or identified themselves as such and kept claiming to be nonpartisan. um and so the judge didn't didn't uh, see them as as a front group thanks mm -hmm. um and one thing that uh i want to make sure to mention is that you know we we try to um, give folks a chance to ask questions and such, uh, finishing up at 1 p.m. Central Time. That does not mean we have to stop the event then. So um, if we do, you know, if we end up having uh, a fair number of questions left over, we'll, you know, we'll cut them off. It'll just kind of depend on uh, Professor Levinson's time. Uh, and of course, how much time all of you have. Are there, are there other questions Oh, and comments? Let me, just, let me just say real quick that, um, while I normally teach at one, I push my class back by half an hour so I can stay a little longer if, if need be. I am not at immediately seeing another question. Um, how about this? I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and pose one while everybody's kind of uh, cogitating. Um, I, have very little experience um, with uh, informal housing, uh, 
Um, but I am certainly experienced seeing it from afar, seeing it in film. We recently, in um, one of my classes, watched a film called The Nile Hilton Incident, in which a fair number of scenes take place in informal housing around Cairo. Um, but also, I recall visiting um, uh, places like Buenos Aires, uh, in which you sort of have to see the informal housing because a lot of it's located near the airport. And I suspect that that's a, a pretty common uh, occurrence internationally, and it may be common in South Africa as well. Um, which brings me to, to the question about the, the state. I, I, I wonder if uh, another transient population, namely tourists, uh, place any pressure on the state to either observe, call uh, a group of people a population to sort of make them become, in Scott's sense, uh, a population, a sort of state recognized population or, um, or the, the focus of, of state anxiety. And if the state is then placing pressure on those who visit, and especially those who kind of have you know money to spend as uh, as tourists, to either um, uh, ignore them or to try to uh, move them away from the the places that that tourists by necessity are going to see. Yeah, so that no, that's a great uh, point slash question. Um, in Cape Town, I think the dynamic that, that you pointed to is, is spot on, this idea that there's a highway that leads from the airport, which is located on cheaper land, actually not far from Mitchell's Plain. Um, and so in the, the shack where I would usually stay, um, you'd be woken up all night because planes fly right over the shack and it shakes the walls. And um, the highway that you would take to get to the city center, which is where all tourists would stay um, in, in Cape Town, led right by a number of informal settlements, some more visible than others. Um, but there was one in particular that the government saw as an eyesore and they eventually built a wall um, so that it wasn't visible. Um, another settlement that experienced a shack fire instead of being rebuilt, um, they put in um, uh, social housing projects and then painted them in bright colors. And so just trying to kind of um, hide this as an eyesore there's some great literature on this, especially in the run up to the 2010 World Cup, um, because this is when all, the, all of these measures were put into place in Cape Town. So, you know, one of the stadiums was built in downtown Cape Town. So anyone flying in would have to pass by these, by these shacks. So there was an attempt to invisibilize them then. What's interesting about the cases I'm considering here, which I think um, are more representative of most land occupations in Cape Town, is that they're not taking place on, on land, particularly visible to tourists. Um, no tourists would ever go to either of the places that I'm, uh, or I don't say no tourists ever, but there, there's, there's no, no reason for a tourist to go to either of the areas that I'm talking about. Um, and most of the areas, they would be shocked if they saw a tourist. So, you know, it's, well, one is more visible, it's visible to say the middle and, and kind of upper working classes or the formerly employed working classes, less so than to an international audience. Thank you. Um, and I, I see in our Q&A box, uh, one has come up here. Um, now, Zach, is that, is that visible to you, the, the Q&A box? If it's not, I can put it up also in the chat. Uh, oh, here. No, I can see it. Thank you for moving. Wondering whether it's good. Uh, so that whether the state, so if I understand uh, Sarah's question, that, that whether or not the state always has this, um, oh, or here, you can, is it possible to unmute her? I am going to try to, oh, here we go. Sorry about that. Oh, she was remuted. So I, you should be. Okay, there we go. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it was a bit of a convoluted question, so it, it helps if I ask it um, directly. Um, so thank you, Zach. A, a really fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it, and and I think the question that you're asking is really really important um, because, as you say. Um, in terms of eviction, what we're witnessing is not eviction in central land where it's clear that it's about land speculation or what Harvey would call accumulation by dispossession. This is in 
peripheral sites where there wouldn't appear to be uh, a land value to, to justify um, the eviction. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you, you sort of presented these two cases where there's sort of this paradox of um, why the outcome. Um, so I, I really enjoyed your tracing and, the, and this argument that it's sort of the production um, of the population that in some ways a factor in determining the outcome. But I am left wondering, um, I mean, you, you, did, you did also make, I mean, you had a bit of a disclaimer by saying, you know, in another instance, you would have a serial, what you're terming serial or fused and, and the outcome might be different. Um, but, but I was left wondering whether the court as a site of representation and imaginary is also really, really key. Um, so a, a lot of what you talked about was about sort of this notion of the orderly occupier or disorderly um, and opportunist as the, as the contrast. Um, but I think at least the sense that I have of the, of the Cape Town municipality is that occupiers are perceived as disorderly as the point of de departure. There, there isn't even a distinction made. Um, the point of departure is these are acts of disorder and we disapprove. But the tensions that are present in the constitution um, presents constraints to the ability of the state to act in an absolutely violent way um, from the beginning. Um, so, so that's why you know, this becomes a site of struggle as opposed to eviction and erasure. Um, so yeah. I'm just wondering how, to what extent, you know, you, you've, you've given us a narrative of this occupation versus that occupation and the process of seeing the state and being seen by the state, but I'm also wondering the role that the court itself as a site of representation played in that determining ultimately. Um, great, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, so in both of these cases, uh, well, so, so in the case of, of the private property instance, so in, in Citalo, the landowners had the option of either starting at a ward level court or taking it to directly to the high court and they took it directly to the high court. Um, almost strategically thinking that because the high court is located in the city center that fewer occupiers would be able to make it. And I think you're, you're exactly right that there's a default um, position that sees all land, occupy, all land occupations as inherently unruly. And I, I would say it's not even limited to the courts, but um, to the vantage point for insofar as we can think of, of Cape Town's housing department, the Department of Human Settlements as a, a unitary um, apparatus almost, there too, I think the default is to see them as disorderly, um, as posing a, th and ultimately when we ask why, I mean, because you might imagine that in the case of say, I don't know, an ideal typical neoliberal state all into cost cutting and, and cutting uh, public services. And you could imagine that if they redefine self-provision of housing as housing delivery, um, and it's on a, on a far flung plot of land located on the urban periphery, that the city might actually approve of this. And so far as it doesn't um, you know, interfere with investment projects or anything, or development projects, anything like it, um, they, don't, of course, um, pursue that kind of um, analysis. And instead, I think inherently view all occupations as necessarily a threat. Um, I think you're also right to pick up on that it's not some kind of straightforward accumulation by dispossession story we might get in David Harvey. When I started this, this project 12 years ago, I was a dyed in the wool Harveyite. I thought I was going to be mapping eviction frontiers onto development frontiers and do a kind of Neil Smith thing. Um, that is not where I was finding evictions of land occupations. Didn't seem to correlate with real estate value whatsoever. And it was actually the out of the way occupations being evicted. I think the reason it's a default position is because uh, both housing officials and the court view land occupations as, as interfering, let's say, with the government's project of housing delivery. And so if the government's delivered over 3 million homes at this point, I mean, going on 4 million, depending how you define home, um, that land occupations present this sort of embarrassment that expands the, the housing backlog quite visibly. And so sometimes housing officials 
um, at least what I've observed in Cape Town, want to bump these, these land occupiers to the front of the queue just to get rid of the embarrassment and then accuse the very occupiers of being queue jumpers. Um, and so I found what I found really interesting is the way that municipal states produce queue jumping, but then attribute queue jumping to the occupiers themselves. Um, but, but all this is to say, I think you're absolutely right that the default position is to see them all as disorderly and the burden is on them to demonstrate that they're not disorderly or that they're at least sufficiently orderly that they can be tolerated. Yes, thank you. That's, that helps a lot. Thanks. Thanks for the response. Good question. It looks like um, we have another question from Gay Seidman. Well, only if nobody else's questions. I but I would ask, love to ask a follow up to that. I feel like I'm bringing together like two of the great experts on this on this topic, and also it happens to be nobody else has their hand up. So well, as long as nobody else has their hands up, it's fine. Um, just just to follow on that discussion though, I, I'm wondering whether the James Scott perspective doesn't block you a little bit from seeing splits in the state. Because I'm thinking, you know, one of the big splits in the DA was obviously when Patricia DeLille allowed that, um, I can't remember what the squatter settlement that was burnt out above, um, was it above Hout Bay? I can't forget where it was, further down um, Chapman's Peak. And they, the no, city, I sorry? I think Imazama Yetu. I forget, but it was, but it was, but it was Patricia DeLille was allowing them to basically, they were taking care of them and providing and allowed them to go back to the squatter settlement. Right. And I'm pretty sure that's why the DA split and we'll never have power again, right? Because because the colored wing of the DA leadership was much more sympathetic in many ways to yeah. allowing squatters some um, basically housing rights. And I wondered if part of your story, that your story, because you're focusing on the organization, even though that's a really persuasive story, if it wouldn't be worth also bringing in those other splits on the other side where they disagree about how to deal with it. Because some of them see housing as a kind of social right. Yes, yes. No, so this is this is spot on. And I wanna say that um, while it didn't come up in the talk here and some longer writing on this, this is actually exactly what I'm trying to address. How, let's say, what I'm calling the state here tends to be the bureaucratic arm of the, of the state. And when we think about the executive, there's so much disdain among employees for, for um, so how, whether housing officials or whether um, judges, so much disdain for these exceptions that are made by members of, whether it's the city council, whether it's the mayor um, herself, so, and it's not just about race. So even if we go back before Patricia Lill and think about uh, Helen Zilla, who is of course a white DA mayor, there are a couple instances where she visited land occupations and promised them housing. Um, and these big flamboyant things covered on, you know, covered on the news. And one of them, a uh, very small one even, um, named themselves after her. And then, an, and also after an activist who founded it, and so the place was called Zillow Rain Heights. Um, and you know, ultimately, housing officials are really, really frustrated by this and see it as, you know, how can they attack the disorderliness of of these people they're calling queue jumpers when queue jumping is quite obviously produced by these exceptions generated from other sections of the state. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there's a real tension between let's say those who desire formal rationality and those who will occasionally make what I can't describe other than political gifts or something, you know, that, that it's a kind of clientelism um, and they make these exceptions simply to, to win over uh, residents in the area. I, I, can I just jump in though? I yeah. actually think it's not fair to call it clientelism always. Sometimes it's people need housing. Yeah, so sometimes it is people need housing, um, but I can tell you, at least in the case of, of Zilla, the, when she was mayor, the settlements she'd visit were always very small and not, not even close to the most desperate um, and tended to be in strategic areas. And so, you know, I think it, it varies. I think it varies, but yeah, no, I don't. I, think I was thinking of Delos. 
but <laughs> yeah no and delil i don't think it was it was clientelism in that in that kind of narrow sense no i think you're right there um and, and yeah i think motivations vary but i think the fact that they that they do this um the fact that they make these sorts of exceptions is a total thorn in the side of of the more bureaucratic wing of the state whether judicial or whether um, we're talking about the department of human settlement Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think given the time and that I'm not seeing other Q and A's or, um, or hands raised, I think that can uh, allow us to sort of wrap things up. Thank you again for coming. Uh, thank you to Zachary Levinson uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I've learned a huge amount about it and that uh, again is not meant as uh, as any kind of uh, um, flattery whatsoever um, I appreciate it I'm so glad we've been able to, to to keep going with Africa at noon despite the trying times looking forward to seeing you all in person that goes for you too Zach uh, one of these days when when circumstances permit yeah no, thanks everyone I'm gonna start having to attend these things you have to. The series, this looks amazing. So. Um, well, we're very proud of it here and um, love to, to, to bring in guests such as yourself. So thanks, um, thanks everyone.